Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Minika Uwet. Um, I'm one of the Juan Global Board members and I'm also one of the founders of the Juan Ocean Institute. So thank you very much, Juan, everybody, uh, to focus on to this ocean conservation issue. Um, we have wonderful, seriously wonderful panelists today. And I would like to introduce um, Dr. Uh, Akamatsu. Just a few seconds to say hello to everybody. Yeah, very good to be invited. This kind of really nice, wonderful opportunity. And I am um, actually used to be a researcher of dolphins and whales. And uh, that is really fascinating subject. Yeah, but even looking at the whales and dolphins, I'm looking at the very severe effect of their habitat. For example, like uh, we can do the whale watching just off Tokyo in these four years. I'll let you know later on this day. Uh, it's climate change really affecting of the whale habitat in these days. So I'm really enjoying, uh, wish, to, wish to enjoy the discussion with you guys. Thank you. Thank you. And Meg, hello. Hello, good afternoon. Um, it's, I am delighted to be here as well and really appreciate the opportunity to talk about something that is near and dear to my heart and our foundation's heart, which is a thriving and sustainable ocean uh, for our current generation and for future generations. And I will confess to also having been a researcher, as Dr. Komatsu has, um, has explained, I spent almost 21 years at Stanford University uh, directing the Environmental and Natural Resources Law and Policy Program and directing the Center for Ocean Solutions. Thank you, Meg. And uh, Maria? Good morning, everybody. Good afternoon. Good evening, wherever you are. I'm uh, also delightful to be here in this panel. And I'm very happy to be back in Japan in any way. Uh, I still love your country, and uh, I hope we can persuade you that ocean conservation is very important, and we need to take urgent action on it. Thank you, Minako. Thank you, Maria. And uh, lastly, but importantly, Atsushi. Hi, um, good morning or good afternoon. I am actually I'm today joining you from Helsinki, Finland, en route to Iceland, uh, where the uh, the Arctic Circle Assembly will take place now for about a few days from uh, starting a few days from now. And um, the Arctic um, is, of course, is the ocean that we are very much concerned with. And that, this, that the Arctic is the area where we see an uh, intensive uh, effect of climate crisis. Uh, and this is a, a very important gathering, international gathering for all over the world uh, to talk about the con or conservation, including the ocean. and. Uh, but anyway, I'm looking forward to this panel discussion. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for using your transit time and from the um, Helsinki Airport Lounge. But anyway, let's start the conversation. Um, I would like to raise the general questions first. Um, what is the major significant difference we will see in post-COVID world in terms of ocean conservation and ocean strategy? And will the term sustainability get promoted in post-COVID world, for example, to focusing more on the gender issue or labor issues, or to realize equitable and sustainable ocean? Um, well, but before that, sorry, could you, um, uh, Dr. Kamatsu, um, could you quickly remind us the problems that the oceans is facing for the general audience? Yeah, yes. right. The ocean facing a lot of issues these days. And before and after the COVID era, and this is also the big change in the ocean as well. As I told you, the, uh, if the all of the Tokyo area is now in the tropical water, no more like a, just warm water. We have a many tropical water fish, coral reef fish, and also the big humpback whales you know, migrating to just off of the Tokyo area. So we are facing such a big change in the ocean uh, climate, but also that is severely affecting on the fisheries. We Japanese like to eat many of the different types of the seafood, but the uh, the contents of the seafood and also the species is changing year by year. 
Like, for example, like Hokkaido Island is the northern part of Japan. They have a lot of capture of the squid, but it's now it's gradually not quickly disappearing over the captures these days. So probably that it depends on the change of the climate in the ocean as well. And not only for the fisheries, but also di biodiversity, but we also have a lot of like, uh, you know, the garbage and the microplastic you know, circulating all over the globe and coming from the uh, East and South Asia, and also, you know, you know, generating that kind of the pollutant in the all over the Pacific Ocean these days. So now ocean is really connected and uh, we don't have good enough time to solve it, or even we already passed the point of no return. So this is a time we seriously need to think about how we can countermeasures and how we can back to the original healthy ocean is it is a time to do now thank you right so that includes the solving the unsustainable fishing as well right exactly okay thank you very much so getting back to this general question uh can i start asking for meg please so what is the uh, major difference after the post-covid world do you think, you think? Thank you, Monaco. Um, well, I think COVID has taught us many things, uh, including that no one country or one sector can succeed on its own, and that the human dimensions of our work are more important than ever. Um, COVID brought us uh, into, um, into a place where we recognize that uh, what happens in China or Europe or the United States happens in Japan, South America, um, or um, the Far East. So, uh, and it also really brought into focus that we needed um, human-centric solutions uh, to, to deal with the pandemic. So going forwards, uh, solutions to address ocean health decline will reside at the intersection of complex social, economic, political, and ecological systems where we better align incentives across systems to achieve outcomes that deliver benefits for both people and for nature. And when I'm talking about um, sort of these systems level or global level efforts, I am talking about things like the um, UN Ocean Decade and the FAO um, Blue Transformation Roadmap. These are um, frameworks that essentially pull together these um, different um, systems, private sector, public sector, civil society systems, um, and, and align, attempt to align these systems um, so that they actually work for ocean health and for people. Um, that is probably the, the sort of the core of what I think we've learned from COVID. Thank you. So the solution should be uh, served by the um, collaboration of the every uh, stakeholders, right? And uh, let's uh, ask for Maria, please. Thank you, thank you, Minako. I totally agree with what Meg already said. And following up on that, I would like to focus on three main conclusions I have taken from the pandemic. The first is that if we are talking about global threats, as Meg already said, we need global solutions. So international governance coordination is absolutely essential here. And I mean, though we are living in a fragmented world because of geopolitical challenges and the war, I think that we need uh, to focus more on international cooperation. USA, European Union and Japan will be the first approach, but we need also to engage everybody even China and Russia in under the UN framework. And also we need a better coordination, public-private partnerships will be very essential here. And also we need better coordination between the different sec sectors. I mean here, climate change, biodiversity and ocean. We have to make the ocean visible. So my first conclusion is, 
global solutions. The second conclusion is that we need solutions based on science. We have seen countries who have followed scientific advice from the very first moment to succeed in facing the pandemic easier and better. So this is something we have to keep on. We cannot ignore science anymore. And my third conclusion is that we need uh, what Meg put it very, very, I like very much your expression, Meg, human-centric solutions. This means that we have to in be inclusive and include everybody, local communities, uh, overcome uh, uh, gender issues or other gaps. We need everybody in, if we want a better result. Thank you, Minako. Thank you very much. It's so well wrapped up and uh, the global solutions and the other uh, science matters. Yes, thank you. And can I ask Atsushi? Yes. Um, you know, I, you know, I would echo what Meg and Maria are saying that uh, after coming out of this COVID, um, the lesson we learned through this pandemic was the one thing that is uh, that is internet, the importance of us collaborating together. This is the this is a global agenda, global problem, and global solution need to be delivered by all of us working together uh, and and really fighting for this uh, uh, common uh, problem. And uh, one thing we really uh, experienced over the last three years or so is that 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 we could we could and we should work together. Uh, otherwise, it's just not. The, uh, the 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 world it would suffer uh, tremendously from both not only health but also the economy and and so on and so forth but then of course unfortunately the uh the recent Russia's invasion Ukraine and also the height the sort of the rise of this uh, geopolitical challenges that we face are really putting the uh, things like what Meg was saying about how United Nations or international uh, framework for really addressing and combating and implementing some of the solutions that we have to deliver to, to fight uh, for the oceans and for the uh, climate and other things uh, or public health issues or you know SDGs, all the, all the questions are raised by SDGs. And, but it's... It's you know and the fact fact that I'm I'm actually joining you from uh, Finland, which is the sort of forefront of how the Russia and the people here feels about the current situation, and and it's very difficult to be optimistic in terms of you know things like what we have been discussing uh, in, and how we're gonna overcome this uh, geopolitical challenges that we face, particularly here in Europe, uh, and then. In Japan, of course, the, with the North Korea's uh, constant uh, launch of the missiles uh, over us, uh, or the rise of China, you know, all these things are very, very, uh, you know, affecting, uh, you know, in a way that we should be actually talking all of us together to address the issue of uh, common agendas and global solutions. So, uh, I think, uh, well, the. Uh, after the Crimea incident, you know, uh, the Russia kept in the international world uh, the two things. One is the Arctic, and the other is the International Space Station program. And those two, in spite of that hard, you know, the, those problems, uh, recent problems, they sort of kept the stance of cooperation. And so, um, anyway, can the Russia and the all of us work together? Uh, to save the Arctic or the climate crisis is a challenge that I will be discussing uh, next few we, uh, days in Iceland. But I think we really need to come up with other alternatives or some other ways of saving uh, this uh, internet, that sort of the momentum that we started with, a, you know, fighting together for the COVID and pandemic. So. I, you know, I look forward to the discussions in this panel for this point. Well, thank you very much. And it sounds like that uh, we needed an international collaboration, but we have to sort of exceed the um, the current situation. And uh, Tom, would you like to add, please? 
Yeah, I echo the tsunami sound very much. And, uh, you know, even in this kind of really difficult situation, but the ocean connected each other, and no matter what, the Russian, China, Japan, uh, even for the uh, Norway. And so the ocean is something like a very good global agenda. We can reach some kind of agreement in between, even like uh, uh, different countries or in the area. Uh, for example, like uh, fish resources, we are using the same fish stocks and we need to manage it and that we need some win-win solutions in between the different countries that we are catching like a, for example a salmon and the russian and chinese and japanese fishing vessel are catching the same stock of the salmon and we have something a treaty uh in between us so this kind of the collaboration you know beside of the military affairs that kind of the collaboration is really feasible are also a win-win solution for both of the countries and no matter what such kind of the you know the uh, fisheries or economical activities but also the pollutant and also the climate change countermeasures that is only we can get we can win you know, as long as we collaborate and we just lose we don't collaborate at all so just we, we can you know, separately think about such a military uh, geopolitics up here and the ocean conservation and ocean conservation itself is a really good window to open the conversation between the completely different philosophy so i think this is something the key to open all the kind of conversation and dialogues thank you very much that's very important that we've been talking about the uh, uh, fish stock but which is like a sh uh, shared asset of everyone on the globe so um let's um uh, it, and anything that we, we would like to add? Anybody? Or otherwise, we, shall, we, shall we just move on to the one-by-one one questions? And I would like to start with Meg. Um, the, the question that I just sort of um, prepared for you is that we are facing the serious problems of climate change, biodiversity, and unsustainable fisheries. How do you think the world should tackle these issues together? What makes us solve these problems diffi uh, difficult? Um, it's been the same sort of issue that we've been already discussing on the sort of general questions, but can, I, can we just uh, go in more specific way? Thank you. Yeah, I think that at the heart of this challenge is the fact that these are um, tightly interlinked uh, threats to ocean health and, and also threats to local communities who directly depend on uh, on healthy ocean ecosystems. And we know at least 3 billion people globally rely on healthy ocean ecosystems for their livelihoods and for, um, for nutrition. Um, so it's essential that we not only think globally, as we've explained, but we also think very locally, because that is where change is going to occur on the water, if you will, um, and in communities. And, um, and I think that the, the key here is understanding that um, there is increasing pressure on these um, local systems um, that also harbor some of the most diverse uh, marine biodiversity on the planet. Uh, and that these ecosystems, as um, Dr. Kamatsu explained, are under intense pressure. And they, they experience pressure simultaneously from climate change, overfishing, um, and other forms of unsustainable fishing, uh, and marine biodiversity loss that is largely caused by habitat loss. So um, the kinds of solutions that that we envision and, and envision all along through the Sustainable Development Goals and through the FAO roadmap um, uh, are going to be solutions where local communities are, must be empowered and supported to be a part of developing the solutions and um, implementing them. And this requires uh, that our governance systems support their participation, their inclusion and active engagement, um, that support their delivery of their own local knowledge and expertise um, in combination with the more traditional sciences that we've already um, discussed here. 
Um, and this is this is a real transformation from where we have been in the past with very top down um, interventions affecting local communities. Uh, and and reflects a, a, a big, um, I think, shift in the ocean conservation field, just recognizing this. The, the other thing that I wanted to put forward is something that we haven't talked about at all, but, um, but Dr. Komatsu and, um, doc, and at, uh, at, Atsushi-san um, um, also um, put this forward, which is climate change has become the greatest imminent threat to ocean health. And um, so not only is the ocean a victim of climate change, but it is a it is a potentially strong ally for us in the fight against um, climate change. And so I wanted to just introduce the idea that um, we need to embrace um, what could be potentially um, between 20 and 25 percent of the emission reductions we need to achieve a safe climate future that can come from ocean-based solutions. And that is equivalent to what the United States, you know, annual emissions are right now. So it's a, it's a potentially very, very significant contribution to the fight against uh, climate change. Um, I'd be more than happy to go into details on that if there are um, follow-up questions. Yes, it's really interesting that you just mentioned about the ocean-based solution. Could you just, just really, really short explanation for us to explain? Yeah, a couple of um, uh, global analyses involving a number of um, uh, just eminent experts over the last couple of years, starting in 2019, um, studied this question and, uh, and concluded that there are a, a a swath or a spectrum of ocean-based climate solutions uh, that merit our attention because of their potential uh, contribution. I'm going to add two to um, the spectrum that those experts uh, uh, laid out. Uh, one is stopping new offshore oil and gas development. Um, nothing makes more sense than simply keeping those fossil fuels in the ground, in the seabed. Um, that is a win for the ocean and it is a win for climate. So that one hadn't been treated by these experts. And the second one that hadn't been treated by these experts is uh, ocean carbon dioxide removal. This is a very, unlike you know, oil and gas, where we have a lot of experience and, um, and what that entails um, and the consequences of it and, and, how, and we have a growing appreciation for how to stop it. Um, ocean carbon dioxide removal is an emergent field, but it has um, put the potential to be very powerful uh, involving uh, both technologies um, like electrochemical processes and, um, and approaches that rely on ocean um, biological systems uh, to actually uh, further draw down atmospheric carbon. And um, so those are two that hadn't been treated, um, but the ones that the, the experts did identify are scaling up ocean renewables and primarily offshore wind, decarbonizing the maritime industry, protecting and restoring blue carbon habitats like mangroves, salt marshes, and seagrasses. And, um, and the, I think I'll leave it there because those were identified as the most important ocean-based solutions. That sounds, gosh, it sounds really uh, the grand issue, but it, you know, the ocean, um, well, the oil, oil development and the, uh, renew, uh, the dark side removable, all those things that will involve the business sectors, not only the political decisions. And it's, it's absolutely like a, uh, like a sort of collaboration of every sector. It sounds like it's, it's fabulous. Um, it is. And if I could just add one more thing, and I apologize sure. for um, uh, go on, go on. doing this, but what is, what is super critical um, as we contemplate these ocean-based climate solutions is to recognize that um, these solutions also involve um, um, potentially um, significant risks, further risks 
to ocean ecosystems and to communities that are going to be most affected by them. So having strong ecological and social safeguards and codes of conduct as we pursue these solutions is going to be vital. Right. Well, thank you so much for very important uh, information. And can we go on to the, um, the question for Maria? Can I? Okay. Um, as a, a former D, uh, Director General of the Ocean that you have um, already uh, shown the way to achieve the fisheries being sustainable and profitable, which we call or you named the blue growth. And how can and should business sector in the world and specifically in Asia and in Japan uh, support and pr promote ocean sustainability? Maria. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Minako. So uh, let me come to this idea of the blue growth. I introduced this idea, let's say, 10 years ago. And the, the basic concept behind it was that uh, science uh, was proving at that moment to us that we can keep both ocean and people happy. We had a, an opportunity to go to take, uh, to take advantage of the great resources that the ocean gives us, and at the same time, we can keep ocean healthy. Is this still the case? I would like to put that question because as Dr. Akamatsu and Tsunami uh, and, uh, and Atsushi Tsunami said, we are in a dangerous path right now. And we are, how can I say, we are running out of time. But I still believe that there are solutions. And uh, what Meg said, uh, it makes my life easier because he, she has given us a lot of solutions based on notions that can give answers to the most, uh, most, most important threat we are facing now, which is climate crisis. So I don't go, to, I'm not going to repeat uh, the solutions that Meg uh, said, but I would like to focus mostly how the private sector can focus on that and give you some examples, perhaps what the private sector can do. Just to give you an idea, um, we, we have the insurance industry, a lot of money there. So instead of building walls to protect us from uh, the uh, threats that now the climate change is giving to us, like uh, tsunamis or um, uh, hurricanes or whatever, we have to invest to natural climate solutions. And this can be a win-win solution because it can protect our shores, our uh, uh, mangroves, our, uh, uh, the coastal areas, the local communities, and at the same time, give us safety from the climate change. Another example, the fisheries industry. The fisheries industry, they are um, trying to take more and more fish, fish from the sea. Instead of doing that, perhaps they can focus on more sustainable ways to fish, and at the same time, put some money in certification, in systems that can persuade the consumer to make right choices. So to fish less and earn more. I can go on with these examples, but I think that to do all that, we have uh, to stop for a moment and think, because what we are doing now to the ocean is something that is in the wrong direction. I agree with Meg that, trying to have uh, new deep sea exercises instead of trying to protect our common inheritance is not uh, going to end well. And one last point, as Meg said, I would like to elaborate on that. We need to think very carefully about the impact of all these actions to local communities, to the population. And I would like to stop for a moment to say here that we really need to focus more on women. Women can play a very important role if we are talking about fisheries, for example, 
women already are participating in the fisheries industry, but we need women as leaders. And I'm uh, focusing on that because this is a need that will be good not only for women. Some people think that we are saying that because we are women and we need to focus more on women. It's not just that. We have seen uh, recently a lot of... Uh, 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 surveys that I have seen one great from McKinsey, for example, that can prove that women leadership can bring more to the whole economy, to the big businesses, to the communities as a whole. So it's not just for women, it's for society as a whole and the economy as a whole. And I hope the leading women for oceans working with other big organizations like UN Women and other networks can bring something more substantial on that. Thank you, Munako. But thank you so much for very important um, comments, Maria, that we learned and that we needed to per perhaps reorganize the subsidies, perhaps, perhaps a bit more the stress onto the focus onto the business sectors. And then also, of course, the leading women so that we need the dis female decision makers to change the, uh, the solutions. And thank you so much. And uh, can I ask the opinions uh, from Atsushi, perhaps, please? Uh, can I just um, repeat the um, the prepared questions and you don't have to follow this, but um, uh, because I know that you're like sort of living Uber Eats version of the academic knowledge. And so you could just you know, put everything here. Um, I'd like to hear about geopolitical crisis in the context of the ocean con conservation. How can we get Russia and China involved? And how can the world work together to solve ocean environmental issues that exceed geopolitics? Well, that's a very tough question. But, uh, I, you know, as for the Russia and China, um, they are not completely out of the whole, you know, the uh, this uh, the discussion on the climate crisis in the oceans in particular. Um, so I think, um, of course, it's now... Russia is having a more difficult time uh, working with the rest of us, uh, the world, uh, even including science. So I think it's a, it's a challenge to keep the door open for the Russian scientists to contribute what they have on the uh, common agenda of climate crisis or Arctic uh, or the oceans. Um, and I know that they would really love to collaborate, but it's just that you know the situation is making it more difficult for them to to. So I would say come out <laughs> to to join us uh, in a in a in an environment where you could work as a scientist to you know to really make the, the world difference. And we don't just don't have a luxury of time to just sit around and wait for anybody to to be able to come and join us. And, and work together. I think that's what the UN decade of ocean science really means. That that there is no uh, no time for 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 us to just sit around and talk about science. But we need to have scientists actually taking real actions to deliver the solutions to this global challenge. So I think, uh, uh, and of course, you know, bringing uh, uh, the, the 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 overcoming geopolitical. Uh, issues is also is always difficult uh, in the international setting. So uh, we have to really do what we can do step by step in a realistic sense. And uh, that means that, uh, uh, you know, can you, Britain, or, you know, UK, or even, or Japan, or even Korea, I mean, we, we are not even collaborating yet to the level that we need to be. <laughs> you know, we're not just talking about what we're going to do with the Russians or what we're going to do with the Chinese and what we're going to be doing or all the geopolitical challenges. But among, you know, what we call it like-minded uh, countries, we're not even still there in terms of uh, uh, collaborating in our side, you know, our efforts in climate, uh, solving the climate crisis or the ocean issues, IUU fisheries, you know, uh, all, the, all these uh, important issues that we could do, do even better than what we are doing, uh, even among ourselves. Uh, how about what are we going to do with uh, 
uh, Southeast Asia or ASEAN countries, or how what 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 can we do in the area of Asia, or what can we do with Africa? Um, blue economy, um, all these challenges that in spite of this geopolitical so-called, you know, can we agree at the United Nations level of everybody else there to, to one, one issue, but in the, at the regional level or uh, uh, of, uh, of us just collaborating together in solving uh, all these issues, uh, we're not, we, we, we can do a lot more in terms of uh, uh, working together. So I think uh, uh, that's something that we should be, uh, talk, uh, and then keep the door open if, it, you know, uh, for uh, for for anybody who would really uh, I I know especially the scientists uh, that are work on the common uh, ground, in spite of what their nationalities are, they they know what the problem is, they know what they need to be doing. So I think that's where we think uh, that I, I'm still still a little bit hopeful in terms of uh, the question you raised. Thank you very much. Oh, right, okay. Can I say one more thing? Uh, the uh, about uh, leading a woman in the uh, ocean. I I mean, I'm 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 a really full supporter of the uh, women leaders, uh, not uh, in, in every aspect of our society. Not just because, you know, that's. But I think it's really uh, that's something that that uh, we need to be more uh, pushing for. Otherwise, uh, you know, that's a it's a social. Uh, the benefit, uh, not just for the uh, the, the the problems of the uh, where the man saying something about the woman sort of thing, but uh, as as Maria said, so I I'm I'm I hope that uh, the uh, women uh, leaders uh, also uh, have some way of uh, overcoming these geopolitical challenges that we have been discussing. Thank you so much that I understand that, you know, thank you so much, uh, Atsushi. Um, sounds like that the um, leading women is like sort of uh, asset, the social asset that we haven't really fully used yet. And so um, can I ask next and ask uh, Tom about your opinion, please? Yeah, thank you so much. And uh, inclusion is very much important, not only for the, but just the biodiversity, but also human society diversity. We definitely need the uh, inclusion with different you know, people, different genders and different kinds. And that's, you know, create a new idea to open the future works. As uh, Tsunami-san said, it's a really a critical situation of international affairs these days. And the world is connecting, you know, it's really much kind of web like a Ukraine issue uh, stops the uh, export of the wheat to the Africa. And that is another kind of full crisis in the African continent, right? And also the uh, Russian uh, trying to shut down of the uh, natural gas supply. So these kind of the network uh, rely on each other. That is also make the international issue is very difficult to solve it. So what I'm suggesting, proposing is more like a local sustainability. Uh, local sustainability is means something like uh, uh, surviving by ourselves, surviving just by lo local communities. I, I have a hobby for the kind of kayaking and outdoors, so I have a small boat with me. So if in case the big earthquake hit the Tokyo Bay and it can be flooded, I'm very much happy to you know, rescue for other guys by using my small boat. So I think I can survive even the flat situation, but it's just a small you know, example, even like a small fishery villages. And if they can survive by themselves, just by their local fish and support supplying to the kind of supply chain and uh, the, the supermarket, then that makes the much more kind of sustainable for the local fishermen, local fishermen community as well. And this kind of local sustainability is required not only for the fisheries, but also the energy as well. If we are using a, no, a renewable energy, just like an offshore windmill farm or a solar panel, whatever, and if that local community supply or generate energy for the consumption of the local community, that makes the local community much more sustainable. But the local community sustainable is not in, uh, sufficient because the, we are facing for the nature, we are harvesting the nature, the resources like a fish, but that is changeable season by season or year by year. So it's really unsustainable. In that case, we need a lot of collaboration 
not only inside of Japan or not only inside the country, but also the international cooperation is quite important. So sustainable local sustainability will be endorsed by the international community or international kind of supportment. So that is, I think, quite similar to the, uh, you know, the internet. You know, the internet was the, uh, developed by the DARPA project in the United States, uh, assuming for the big nuclear war happening in the world. And even that case, the local uh, communication network cannot be tied. That is the basic you know, design of the uh, internet. So if something happens in some area, but still the local community or local data uh, circulation is ensured by the internet now. But still the internet can connect each other, not only for the human by human, but also country by country. Any kind of the, the data accumulation, data uh, circulation is ensured by the internet system. So in the future, this might be too much ideal, but what, what I hope is to, uh, to sharing the data or to sharing the importance of the value, not, no matter what the fish shed is, no matter what bi biodiversity. And okay, there's a degradation of the biodiversity here, but there's a, another good successful example, the increasing diversity in the over there. So how we can compensate, how we can trade, it's kind of like a carbon offset or carbon credit activities. The, uh, we can definitely need to survive. So we need to use some kind of ocean or the earth resources. So that definitely impact the environment of the ocean and earth. And also we need to compensate it to increase the biodiversity or even increase the fish stock. So how we can balance, in that case, we need a data management and also the data sharing. And that I think that is really important for the international collaboration and international authority to endorse such kind of the value of the data. Maybe too much idea. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, do we have time? Is this is wrapping up time? Okay, so but but thank you so much, um, Meg, Maria, Atsushi, and Tom for the wonderful, wonderful uh speeches and the uh sharing your wisdom. And so to wrap up, uh, we were just talking about the um science, the science matters, that's for sure. So the implementation of the transformative ocean science uh is a challenge and the leading women for the ocean that the uh women's uh wisdom uh the is the asset that which for the uh in, for it which should be more appreciated by the international society and also the it's the ocean ocean matters is a global issue and it, at the same time it's a local issue as well so it's kind of the balance of the micro and macro uh issue that we need to um be very, very careful about it. And uh, the key is the international collaboration. No matter what happens in the sort of real world, we need to exceed that geopolitical problems that we still need to collaborate to each other now. And uh, I would like to close this um, session with the uh, appreciation. Thank you so, so much for the wonderful uh, speakers. And uh, we will move to the uh, question and answer time. Thank you very much for uh, fruitful discussions. <clears throat> um, actually, uh, discussion reminds me of ocean conservation uh, consists uh, issues consists of so many uh, issues like uh, climate change, overfishing, microplastic, and all the things are basically uh, external this economy issue, which is a global free rider problem. So, and. Uh, the Paris agreements already gives us a kind of answer. The market mechanism is, is one of the uh, solution for that. And uh, given the uh, all the countries committed to those uh, mechanism. And second, secondly, the mechanism, uh, uh, you talked about the local sustainability mechanism. So uh, market mechanism and local uh, sustainability mechanism, combination of those, would be the solution for those ocean conservations. That's my understanding now. That the question is how to implement these, you know, combinations of mechanism. Uh, if you elaborate on that, that would be helpful for us. Thank you. Who would you like to answer to this? 
Can I say oh, something? Sure. Yeah. Yeah, thank you very much for that's a really point. And the global agenda is not always be accepted by the local people. At the, think about like 7 Eleven, you know, the supply chain. The 7 Eleven store is only focused on the local consumption, local demands. At the central command, always thinking about how they can supply of the each, you know, the uh, the things and food and blah 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 blah. So they are the single company, so they can supply. They can make the supply chain most adequate for the the each command or each demand. But for the case of the ocean, that is a common, you know, the uh, resources. So such kind of the uh, adequate control of the supply chain or like a controlling is not quite well done by, by far. The many of the uh, international organization or the regional uh, fisheries management organization trying to a very big effort to make that kind of more sustainable, more be controllable. That is, that, that is a really big issue. I don't have any clear answer but definitely need some kind of the uh, what I what I said, uh, commanding and assessing of the sustainability of that activities. Did I answer your question? Can I add something here, Minako, if I may? Please, please. So I can understand that there is a challenge here, and I'm not saying that anybody can have a silver bullet to answer that question. What I would like to remind you though, is that we have technology now that can help us a lot. The technology can help us a lot under a condition though. So what I have in mind is an open access data platform that can connect the big industry with local uh, production and consumption. If we can do that, this can help a lot. Also, technology can help us to overcome the problem of illegal fishing and all, uh, all these problems that are connected with that. So if we have, if we are going to take advantage of the new technologies, but under transparency, fulfilling the transparency principle, I think we can keep the balance that the question implies. Thank you, Minako. Minako. I'd yes, like, please, Meg. May I build on Maria's comments uh, and uh, the doctor's comments uh, and provide maybe a, a very concrete uh, example that is at the intersection of markets, uh, local fisheries, and industrial fisheries. This will be real familiar to Maria. Um, right now, we have market systems, including certifications and ratings um, for our for the seafood sector, um, and we have distortions in the markets uh, within the seafood sector. Um, the certification and ratings uh, have not fully onboarded the social side of the human dimension side of fisheries um, and are just starting to do so. Um, and our existing um, global market arrangements allow for, um, for the, uh, the equivalent of both um, harmful fuel, harmful subsidies that encourage overfishing and unsustainable fishing um, and um, human subsidies to overfishing and unsustainable fishing. And I'm talking about uh, the harmful fuel subsidies primarily that could be converted to beneficial subsidies that would encourage uh, more sustainable uh, fishing and the human subsidies to, um, to overfishing uh, is essentially that area that we call illegal, unreported, unregulated fishing um, that some refer to as pirate and slave fishing where, um, where egregious human rights abuses occur. And these are directly subsidizing overfishing that we, we have workers involved in, in the seafood industry who are not paid um, or extremely underpaid um, without which uh, uh, these companies would not be able to afford to go as far as they fish and as long as they fish. And this is particularly acute um, when we're looking at 
small scale fishing communities, and I'll use um, West Africa as an example, um, whose traditional fishing territories are becoming increasingly encroached on by these IUU um, vessels and are moving into their territorial seas and stripping these local communities of their food stocks. So where's what's the solution to this? Well, it is both local and global. It is at a local level, protecting the marine tenure of these communities and um, protecting their territorial seas and enforcing those protections against um, what are largely foreign fleets. Uh, and at a global level, it is insisting that we get rid of these harmful subsidies um, through the WTO that continue to support um, overfishing and unsustainable fishing. And that at the RFMO levels and within our certification and rating systems and through our domestic um, uh, trade policies, uh, we directly take on um, this problem of human rights abuses within uh, fisheries. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. That you mentioned about the um, harmful subsidies. That it sounds like a big, big challenge. That it's probably very difficult to rip something that you've already got, and you know, that the changes. Yeah, how, well, how we're making progress. This year at the WTO, we finally made progress. What, Maria, after 20 years of... Uh, yeah, after of 20 years, it was really amazing. I totally agree with you. But now we need the two thirds of the members of WTO to submit their plans. So we have a way to go, but this is why we are here. We have to push for these solutions. There are solutions. What I take from what Meg just said is that, guys, there are solutions for this. Of course, we have to act properly. <laughs> it sounds very promising, and it's really nice to go on and make any progress on. And any other questions do we have? From no one? Right. Um, can I ask more about uh, the uh, the uh, leading women issue, Maria? That we still have five minutes. Okay, I'll try to make it um, very very quick because um, what I would like to say is perhaps already known uh, for most of women. Women can feel in their how can I say from their experience in their life that there are challenges ahead. And what I would like to say is to encourage women not only to ask for a job, which is happening now, and uh, we have increasing numbers about uh, women working in the private sector and in the public sector, but I would also, would I also like women to encourage women to ask for a leading position. And uh, having women in leading positions as the surveys scientific surveys have proved, can bring more balance to the discussions in uh, the decision-making processes. What, uh, what I mean by better balance, women have a better view of time because they have to go for a multitask roles. They have to have a house. They have to have uh, all this uh, care. Sometimes they care about elders. They have children, they have, uh, so multitask uh, ways to solve problems uh, is something that they are familiar with. So if they are in leading positions, they can bring their experience. So as uh, Dr. Akamatsu said, it's not just about uh, social diversity. It's about how we are going to get the best of it and try to solve the problems. And also women can help us with other aspects of sustainability, like um, trying to reconcile family life with business life, try to reconcile consumption with what makes really sense. 
they are making choices about food products and the food in general. So they will be valuable. But I would like to repeat and close my intervention with that. It's not just about women. It's about society as a whole. It's about diversity as a whole. It's about uh, conservation as a whole. Yes, thank you very much. Um, any other question? Yes, please. Yeah, we fully uh, discussed about how to you know, cope with the uh, environmental issues, ocean uh, conservations. But uh, supposing if it doesn't work it out, what's going to happen? And uh, especially uh, something happens, we need to adapt. We need some kind of adaptable strategy for each country, for each affected area. So uh, what kind of adaptation strategy we need to think about in the future? It fails. It fails. <laughs> we probably would like to take this issue positively. <laughs> However, um... yeah, let me simply say learn from the south, transit to the north, according to the global warming. So uh, the climate ban is changing north and the south in the long, long history. So we have different knowledge, different adaptation way in different climate bands. So we can learn, I think. I can add something to that. I just attended, um, I mean, uh, some weeks ago, the United Nations General Assembly, and there was a conference very, very relevant to what this gentleman is asking. It was a conference about what we are going to do if we fail. To, to if we fail to to handle climate crisis, and I think there are solutions. There are solutions uh, that are still based on nature. This is something that I would like to underline. So if we fail, it doesn't mean that we have to move away from the effort to see humanity as a part of nature. So nature-based solutions. Sustainability solutions can be there, of course, under another, how can I say, under another hat. Uh, and the hat will be that we have to realize that our failure is going to be the end of the planet. So I hope that at that case, there will be urgent solutions in place. And there are ideas about urgent solutions, for example, to put a special value in nature, to give uh, nature a value and a price. If you use the nature, you have to pay a price. If you are going for CO2 emissions, then you have to pay a price. But I hope that we are going to solve the problem before arriving there. But there are solutions and there will be urgent solutions and painful. This is something we have to have in mind. Thank you, Dr. Tsunami. Uh, Atsushi, would you like to add something for that? Or if you have any in general um, comments? No, I, th I think the the solutions that uh, either adaptation or mediation in general, I think really needs to, especially in the area of oceans, conservation depends on the advance of science and technology that may really transform what we have been doing more effectively. And I think uh, that the data and the uh, application of AI and, and the access to this tons, tons of data that we haven't really uh, leveraged uh, before that may have uh, some way of uh, providing some guidance to what to do with uh, even including subsidies and effectiveness of market uh, mechanism uh, because just that we don't we're having traditionally the all this sector that is really unknown to most of us we're just doing play by our traditions and play by our sort of so i i mean making it more science science-based uh behavior or making decisions on any of this may really uh, find a way to transform its uh, uh, that that perceived failure of any of these uh, uh, mechanisms because and the transparency that we share all that uh, together. I think that's uh, going to be a very important. 
Thank you so much. The transparency is one of the key words that's very important. And then I think that we're going to wrap up and invite uh, to close this session. But uh, the balance of the um, the global issue and a local issue, and also the balance of the men and women in the society, uh, the the volume of the voice of them, and uh, well, the international society that we need to collaborate in, that is for sure. And uh, the key is that we will let's continue and thank you so so much for uh, uh participating in this session it's really important uh people are here and i appreciate it thank you very much <laughs>